Long before the Industrial Revolution, before Damascus blades clashed in distant deserts, and before Europe lit its first blast furnaces, a small island in the Indian Ocean quietly mastered the power of fire and wind. This is the forgotten story of Sri Lanka's ancient iron industry. The Yaka people are among the earliest known inhabitants of the island, remembered in ancient chronicles and oral traditions. Believed to have possessed advanced knowledge of natural elements, they are often associated with the origins of Sri Lanka's ironworking heritage. They lived in close relationship with the land and are believed to have possessed deep knowledge of natural materials, earth, fire, and metal. Many scholars trace Sri Lanka's early ironworking traditions back to this era, long before formal kingdoms took shape. In the 1990s, British archaeologist Dr. Gil Juleff made a startling discovery in the windy hills of Samanalawewa. She found rows of ancient furnaces embedded in the ridgelines, each precisely aligned to catch the southwest monsoon winds. These were no ordinary furnaces. They were natural draft smelters, ingeniously designed to reach temperatures over 1,200 degrees Celsius using nothing but the natural force of wind and charcoal, an engineering marvel unknown elsewhere in the ancient world. Radiocarbon dating of charcoal from these furnaces revealed something remarkable. They date back to as early as 300 BCE, over 2,300 years ago, placing them in the era of King Devanampiya Tissa. This means Sri Lankans were producing high-carbon steel centuries before similar technologies appeared in Europe or East Asia, an achievement that strongly supports the idea of Sri Lanka as an independent center of metallurgical innovation, driven by its own scientific understanding and harmony with nature. This method of using natural draft was previously unknown in the global archaeological record. It challenged long-held assumptions and shifted focus away from Eurocentric models of technological progress. Julif eventually identified 77 ironworking sites in the southern highlands, most of them facing westward, perfectly aligned with the fierce southwest monsoon that blows from June to September. At one site alone, she excavated 41 furnaces, all aligned in a near-continuous north-south line. Each furnace had a semi-permanent rear wall built into the slope, with a temporary front wall made using clay tuyeres, telescoped, pre-fired clay pipes designed to channel airflow. These tuyeres in the furnace's shape enabled a low-pressure bubble to form at the top of the open furnace when the wind passed over it, creating a natural draft that sucked air steadily through the base. Smelting trials using local ore, traditional charcoal, and replica tuyeres produced high-carbon steel with yields of up to 17 kilograms of metal from just 100 kilograms of ore, a remarkable result for early iron smelting, reflecting both efficiency and metallurgical precision, an impressive result for pre-modern methods. The ore used was found to contain between 79% and 87% iron oxide, classifying it as high grade, and the charcoal was produced from locally preferred tree species like Yakata Maran, Syzygium zelanicum, Paphudamba, Syzygium spathulatum, and Dumba, Syzygium gardneri. The clay for the furnaces was a local mix of paddy field clay, termite hill clay, sand, paddy husks, and straw, showing a deep indigenous knowledge of material science. These experiments showed that the Samanala Wewa furnaces were not only effective, but more efficient in producing carbonized steel than any other pre-modern method recorded. The resulting product, sometimes called furnace steel, was of such high purity that some scholars believe it may have been the source of the famed Serendibi steel prized in the Islamic world for crafting Damascus swords. Serendibi refers to steel from Serendib, or Serendib, the Arabic name for Sri Lanka. In fact, the 9th century Arab scholar Al-Kindi, in his treatise on the manufacture of swords, explicitly mentions Serendib steel among the finest steels of the known world, alongside those from India, Persia, and Spain. While he did not describe how it was made, the mention confirms that Sri Lankan steel was recognized and valued in global trade as early as the Islamic Golden Age. The Samanala Veva discovery didn't just surprise archaeologists, it challenged global assumptions about where and when true metallurgical innovation began. The significance of this discovery reached an international audience when it was featured in the prestigious journal Nature in 1996, drawing global attention to Sri Lanka's pioneering wind-powered iron smelting technology. Dr. Julev's interest in Samanalawa was first sparked by a reference in Ananda Kumaraswamy's 1908 book Medieval Sinhalese Art, which mentioned iron smelting in the region. While working with archaeologist P.B. Karunaratne and the Department of Archaeology on Environmental Impact Studies for the Samanalawa Dam Project, she followed local leads and oral traditions. 
Some villagers recalled stories from their grandfathers about iron being made in the hills. The current phase of research has turned toward exploring possible connections between Sri Lanka's ancient iron smelting traditions and those found in regions such as Burma, Cambodia, Sarawak, and most intriguingly, Japan. While the power source differed significantly, natural wind in Sri Lanka versus bellows in the Japanese Tatara, recent studies have revealed intriguing structural parallels and potential similarities in the smelting process between Sri Lanka's unique linear furnaces and the Tatara furnace, famous for crafting steel for samurai swords. Though these similarities may be a result of independent innovation, they point to a fascinating area for further comparative study and raise the possibility of shared or parallel metallurgical developments across Asia. But the innovation didn't stop in the hills. In Yodhawewa, near the ancient port of Mantai, archaeologists uncovered evidence of crucible steel production, an advanced technique where iron and carbon were sealed inside clay containers and slowly heated to perfection. This method is remarkably similar to what the world would later call Wootz steel, famous for its strength, purity, and beautiful patterned blades. Could Wootz steel have roots in Sri Lanka? Some researchers believe that Sri Lanka may have been an early pioneer of crucible steel, citing evidence from Yodawewa that could be contemporaneous with, or perhaps even predate, the most celebrated South Indian sites. Samanalawewa and Yodawewa were not isolated instances. Across the island of Sri Lanka, a remarkable density of ancient iron smelting sites has been discovered, painting a picture of a widespread and vital industry. From the highlands around Alakolawewa, where large-scale bloomery iron production flourished near Dehigaha Alakanda as early as the 2nd century BC, to the ancient power centers of Anuradhapura and Polonarua, where sophisticated iron tools dating back millennia have been unearthed, evidence of advanced ironworking is abundant. The Kiriyoya Basin alone has revealed over 20 distinct iron production sites, indicating a significant industrial landscape. Even the eastern coast, in areas like Wakare near the Kunjal Kalkulam Reservoir, has yielded mounds of iron slag and furnace fragments. The regions around Balangoda, including Mawalgaha and Kaskama, while more recently known for traditional crucible steelmaking, also represent a continuation of a long-standing metallurgical tradition. Whether through the wind-powered furnaces of the highlands, bellows-driven crucibles, or bloomery furnaces found across the island, each of these locations tells a fragment of the same compelling story. A civilization deeply connected to the Earth's resources, the transformative power of fire, and the intricate skills of craft. This island-wide network of metallurgical knowledge, meticulously passed from generation to generation of artisans, quietly but powerfully shaped the foundations of Sri Lanka's ancient economy, providing the essential iron for everything from agricultural tools and construction materials to formidable weaponry and intricate religious artifacts. While China mastered cast iron and both India and Sri Lanka became renowned for their crucible forged wood steel, Sri Lanka charted a different path, one guided by nature itself. No mechanical bellows, no forced air, just the wind itself, captured and directed by the island's ancient engineers. This made Sri Lanka's metallurgical tradition not only advanced but sustainable, a rare balance of science and ecology. These remarkable technologies mark the island as a center of ancient innovation, a chapter of history the world has only begun to rediscover. The world celebrates Damascus steel and Roman engineering, but few speak of Samanalawewa, few remember Yodawewa, and few know that Sri Lanka once stood among the great innovators of iron and steel. And though the ancient furnaces may lie silent, the craft still lives on. In villages like Natandia, Alawa, and parts of Kandy and Uva, blacksmiths still shape iron using time-honored tools and techniques. Their fires are smaller, the tools more modern, but the spirit remains unchanged. These artisans may not know the full extent of their lineage, but in their work lives the echo of a civilization that once forged steel from wind and fire. Today, a full-scale reconstruction of the Samanailoewa wind furnace can be seen at the Martin Wickramasinghe Folk Museum in Kogala, Built using traditional materials and techniques under Dr. Julev's guidance, it stands as a tribute to the scientific brilliance of our ancestors and a reminder of a time when Sri Lanka's hills rang with the sound of fire, steel, and wind. Perhaps it was the Yaka people, those early knowledge keepers of this land, who first listened to the wind, who shaped stone into fire, and who gave rise to one of the most remarkable yet overlooked metallurgical traditions in the ancient world. 
The story of Sri Lanka's iron industry is not just about metal. It's a story of innovation, balance, and a deep understanding of nature. A story that belongs to all of us, and one we must choose to remember. This is Hella Nomad, on a journey to rediscover the brilliance of our forgotten past.